Hey everyone, this is Ryan here and welcome back to our periodontic series. This video will be about non-surgical periodontal therapy. And we've talked in the series so far about all of the factors that lead to periodontal disease. And so now we're finally going to start talking about how we can take care of those factors, remove them, and return to a state of health. So local periodontal therapy is designed to remove bacterial plaque and local factors that favor its accumulation. And the meat and potatoes of this therapy is what's called scaling and root planing. Both of these have specific definitions, and scaling is defined as the removal of both supergingival and subgingival plaque and calculus, whereas root planing is talking specifically about removal of embedded calculus and rough cementum. Embedded calculus talking about being embedded into this cementum that has become roughened, and cementum, of course, is the outer layer of the tooth's root surface. So the primary objective in both of these is to restore gingival health by removing these etiologic factors. So let's talk a little bit about the instruments used in scaling and replaning. So the sickle scaler is primarily and only used for removal of supragingival calculus. And that's because, um, and, and this is a zoomed in version of the sickle scaler, the shank and the handle would be up here. So we get a zoomed in look at the working end. So you'll notice the sickle scaler has a very sharp tip and it has a triangular cross section. So here we have the face of the instrument, and then we have a lateral surface on this side and a lateral surface on the other side. So the face would be this upper surface here, and the two lateral surfaces would be on the bottom of the triangle. And so together, this provides two cutting edges, one right here and the other right here. And you can use either of them against the tooth surface to remove and scrape off this calculus. So the sickle scaler has a very sharp tip that could injure gingiva. So it's used above the gingival margin only. But we have curettes that, are, that have a rounded tip that are used for subgingival calculus. So you don't have to worry about ripping and injuring the gingival tissue. So we have universal curettes that can be used in any area of the mouth. They, if we zoom, if we look down at the zoomed in working end, it has the same face and the same two lateral sides, but the tip is rounded. And you'll also notice that the cross section is no longer triangular, but it's semi, it's a semicircle because the whole bottom of the instrument is also rounded off and the face is still straight across on top of this cross section. So everything is pretty similar, except uh, instead of having a triangular cross section, it's semicircular, and um, it has a rounded tip, which allows it to be used subgingivally. So again, the universal curettes can be used anywhere, and we have Gracie curettes that are, that are adapted for specific areas of the mouth. They only have one cutting edge, but they're designed particularly for a very specific area of the mouth. Also semicircular in cross section. And here is a list of five Gracie instruments. And unfortunately, you need to know all of these. But fortunately for us, there is a sort of pattern with these. So each instrument has two numbers. And so there's some that are have two different names, but we kind of group them in the same category as far as memorizing them. And I listed them in numerical order. So the Gracie 1 2 or the Gracie 3 4 are used in the anterior region of the mouth. Gracie 5 6 is used for the anterior teeth and premolars. Gracie 7 8 and 9 and 10 are used in the posterior for facial and lingual surfaces only. The Gracie 11 12 is used in the posterior for mesial, the interproximal surfaces, and the Gracie 1314 is also used in the posterior, but only for the distal interproximal surfaces. 
So the pattern here is it sort of in numerical order goes from front to back. You start anteriors only, then we add in the premolars, and then we're, we're in the posterior from facial, lingual, then mesial, then the furthest back being distal. So it kind of goes in order from front to back, so I use that to help me remember this when I list out all the numbers. All right, and so those were the hand instruments. We talked about sickle scalars and curettes, and now we can talk about ultrasonic scalars, which are used for tenacious calculus. This is calculus that can be harder to remove. Now you can also use hand instruments to get, uh, to get tenacious calculus off, that's for sure, but for the board exam, just remember that they like to um, test that ultrasonic scalars can specifically be used for some tough-to-get calculus. They're contraindicated for patients with pacemakers, infectious diseases spread by aerosol, and at risk for respiratory disease. That's because they spit out a lot of water. And in terms of the, the pacemaker here, electronic dental instruments like ultrasonic scalars and also apex locators used in endodontics could potentially interfere with pacemakers because they use electrical impulses to maintain proper heart rhythm. So that's just an important thing to note. There are two different main types of ultrasonics. There's the magnetostrictive ultrasonic, also called a cavitron, that vibrates in an elliptical pattern. That's the metal tip, vibrates very quickly, really can't see it with the human eye, but it vibrates in an elliptical or oval pattern, whereas the piezoelectric ultrasonic vibrates in a linear pattern. So how I remember this is that uh, I kind of think of a U-shaped magnet, and so magnet for the U-shaped magnet, and it kind of vibrates in a rounded shape. Or if you remember uh, Magneto, he's a comic book villain, has a very oval-shaped helmet. So magnetostrictive, I remember an oval or elliptical-shaped vibration pattern. And piezoelectricity is all about going from positive to negative, positive to negative, back and forth. So I think of a straight line vibration back and forth for that one. So those are two uh, different types of ultrasonics. I would definitely know for the board exam, they can absolutely test which one uses which pattern. Also important to know, ultrasonics have several different functions. So they, again, like I said, they spit out a lot of water. So lavage is to flush the pocket out with a bunch of water. Cavitation is this sort of interesting process that I don't fully understand, where air bubbles collapse and release energy to flush out debris. The actual vibration, which is a mechanical vibration back and forth or an elliptical pattern to remove the deposits and debris, that's really the workhorse here. And also acoustic turbulence, which is agitation that they see in the fluids of the mouth by these, this mechanical vibration that can actually disrupt bacterial cell walls. So all of these combined lead to a very effective plaque and calculus removal. So when we're using both the hand instruments and the ultrasonics, there are different strokes that we use as operators. And again, I feel like I'm saying everything's important, but this is, this is definitely an important video for the board exam because most of the questions in the periodontal, uh, for the periodontal questions will be on therapy. So an exploratory stroke is a light feeling stroke used with probes and explorers. So this isn't for scaling, root planing, anything like that. This is more when we're using a probe to measure pocket depth, to measure clinical attachment loss, or to uh, use an explorer to try to detect if there's calculus present. The scaling stroke used, of course, for scaling is a short, strong pull stroke to remove hard deposits. So that's the only one here out of all four of these that is a strong pull. All the other ones are light or moderate. Root planing, on the other hand, is a light to moderate pull stroke used for final smoothing. So again, that's to remove the embedded calculus in that rough cementum. And ultrasonics, when you use them, it's a light intermittent stroke with the tip parallel to the tooth surface. So you can see how the ultrasonic has this tip that rounds up like this, 
and instead of having the tip against the tooth surface at a 90 degree angle, that could actually damage the tooth surface. So you want to keep it and hold it parallel, light intermittent strokes with constant motion. So being careful not to hold it over the same area of the tooth for more than a second or so. Now, I also included this image because it's really helpful to visualize how to enter and exit a periodontal pocket when using a curette. So when initially inserting a curette into the pocket, angulation between the blade and the tooth should be zero degrees, which is known as closed angle. And when scaling and root planing, this angulation is changed to 45 to 90 degrees, which is known as open angle. Okay, so I'll get the pen out here. And the, the degrees that we're talking about, the angle that we're referring to is between the tooth surface and the face of the instrument, which is, again, that top surface of the cross section. This, again, is a curette, so we're seeing that semicircular cross section as opposed to a triangular cross section. And this makes sense because we're talking about inserting the instrument into the pocket. In other words, subgingivally. So we shouldn't be using a sickle scaler here. We should be using a curette. Okay, so the angle is between the tooth surface and the face of the instrument. So when you're inserting the instrument into the pocket, this should be a closed angle, or the face of the instrument should be parallel to the tooth surface. So it should look like this when you insert the instrument. Then when you're getting ready to scale, you place the instrument against the tooth surface just like this image shows, and this is the perfect angulation for calculus removal. So you can see how it tells you between 0 and 40 is good for insertion, and between 45 and 90 is good for removal. And so that's really important to know for the board exam and for just for clinical knowledge, of course. So, um, so this is to avoid damaging tissue and also to have the best angulation in terms of removing calculus effectively and not burnishing it and smoothing it. You want to get all that calculus out, if at all possible. All right, and lastly, after scaling and root planning, we want to provide a nice prophylaxis for the patient to remove any uh, super gingival plaque that remains on the tooth enamel. So using a profi cup and brush are common tools to use. So the profi cup is on the left here and the cup flexes on slight pressure. And I should say it's loaded into a slow speed handpiece. So this at the actual rubber cup part rotates um, at a slow speed and it's loaded with some profi paste that has some grittiness to it. So when you're using the Profi Cup, it flexes on slight pressure to the contours of the teeth to help in extrinsic stain removal and to have pocket access. So you can actually go uh, slightly subgingival when doing this. The brush on the right here enables better access to select occlusal grooves that the cup couldn't access and also interproximal areas. So like I said, the profi paste that's used in both of these cases is, it's not like normal toothpaste. It has some grittiness to it, somewhere from fine to coarse, that helps remove extrinsic stain and even a microscopically small layer of enamel. Now it's in the micron range, so it's a very, very small amount. But this is why applying fluoride to this new fresh layer of enamel is so beneficial and often why fluoride varnish application or fluoride gel application is paired with a prophylaxis. And there's also a profi jet. This can be used instead of the tr more traditional cup and brush technique, and it delivers a slurry of water and sodium bicarbonate to remove extrinsic stains and soft deposits. All right, so that's it for this video. I hope you found it helpful and interesting. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and we'll see you all in the next video when we start talking about the exciting topic of surgical therapy.